um, that we are going to be um, recording. So if you can go ahead and accept that, that would be great. And then Terrell, whenever you want to kick us off, if you want to wait a couple minutes, that's fine. Um, como lo veis? Maybe wait one or two more. Yeah. I think um, Richard Fletcher is joining us okay. also. So like just joined. Yeah. Good. And, and remember, everybody is, is automatically muted when you come in. But, um, you know, if you want to be heard, by all means, um, unmute yourself. Hey, Richard. Richard. And you're welcome to share your screen, but if you'd prefer not, that's fine too. I like it better when we share our screen. It makes it really feel like a community, but sometimes the Wi-Fi connections don't necessarily cooperate. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Bueno, shall I introduce Mark? Sure. Okay. Um, Mark Gordon has degrees in physical education and philosophy from Oberlin College. And he has an MFA in sculpture from Ohio State. And I'm very proud to say that he was a student of ours um, and a Tinker Foundation fellow in the Center for Latin American Studies, who we sent back in 1987. Oh my God, Mark, I'm dating both of us. To Puerto Rico. Venezuela and the Dominican Republic. Mark has worked in clay for over 40 years, beginning as a potter, wheel throwing, and then expanding into modular assembled clay sculptures and mixed media site specific installations. His work is exhibited in national and international colleges, universities, art centers, and museums. He's traveled to 21 countries to document clay work traditions throughout the Mediterranean, South America, and the Caribbean. He taught as a Fulbright scholar in Argentina and has lectured in Caracas, Cairo, Damascus, Madrid, Jerusalem, Buenos Aires, Valencia, and Santo Domingo. His work has appeared in the New York Times and in many art and ceramics journals, including the Revista Internacional Ceramica in Spain. From 1999 until last month, Mark was on the faculty of Barton College in Wilson, North Carolina, where he taught in the School of Visual Performing and Communication Arts. I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but he apparently remembered fondly his time at Ohio State because at the end of his long and distinguished academic career, he chose to donate his collection of Latin American masks to us. He'll be sharing some of that collection with us today in addition to notes from his trips to collect masks and interview their creators, research that goes back to his days here at OSU. So from across the miles and across the years, welcome back, Mark. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Well, that sums it up. We're done. <laughs> um, well, today I have just a few things to show. Uh, a limited range PowerPoint that includes a few of the pieces at OSU and some others. I have a couple of mask pieces from the study at my house. Uh, those were donated to Barton College, but I stole them for the week. And uh, any questions and discussion we might have afterwards. So um, let me put it in perspective just a bit before the PowerPoint kicks in. Um, I was uh, taking an elective class in, oh, I guess it was phonetics, our first semester there, my first semester there, I think. And uh, Dr. Morgan <laughs> said, you, you've been in Dominican Republic for three years. Why don't you go back there and, and do a study? And he showed me a picture of a carnival mask, which I wasn't familiar with. So um, that's in the slideshow, the photo he showed me. And uh, I put together about 12 different grants from Ohio State, Tinker Foundation, Oberlin gave me an alumni research grant. And um, it was 100 days of, of study, uh, 
I videoed for about 40 hours people making masks. I videoed a few hours worth of uh, carnival celebration. It wasn't carnival, excuse me. It was uh, Corpus Christi, Day of Independence, uh, and just uh, national festivals. So um, let's look at the PowerPoint. I would like you to interrupt if you want. Um, I know there's a delay and sometimes Zoom is awkward, but um, you don't need to save any comments or questions until the end for a very small group. So I'm going to share my screen and put in the PowerPoint. I think I'm going to. Okay. Can you see the screen? Looks good. Unmute. Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. I, as, as Terrell said, I'm a potter. I have been for 47 years, and that's what I'm going to be doing in retirement. And um, these are some tumblers in my workshop uh, last month. Let's see if I can make it advance. Yeah. And so um, some of the sculptural work had to do with tusks. I'm not sure. I didn't choose to do a piece about elephant tusks in clay, uh, protesting the, the decimation of the elephant in 1987. But um, I was wedging clay, which is part of the process of getting it ready. And I let it elongate. I was listening to music, listening to music from Ghana. I remember it after midnight, uh, about two in the morning, wedging clay, and it elongated into a horn shape. And I kept going and eventually made a series of pieces with a tusk shape in clay. So that had to do with the, the horned carnival masks indirectly. They didn't inspire me at first. And um, in a way, that's my connection. I did spend three years in Dominican Republic setting up a pottery training workshop for youth. Um, Jóvenes de Escasos Recursos, we called it. They were on scholarship. Um, this is my group mixing clay on the right and just a group photo on the left. That, that's me on the top left there was, yes. Um, and so three years there, immersed in the culture as much as I could be as a full-time teacher and designer of the program. And uh, that's where I learned to speak, basically. Although I've I started studying Spanish 56 years ago. There's the, I don't know why the photo's so bad, but there's the photo of the catalog that Terrell showed me, Terrell. And it's an exhibition at Parsons School of Design. And it was uh, that mask that got me thinking there's a connection. And the grant, the idea of the research was not strictly, it, it was not an excuse to travel and go back to where I'd been. Um, that was a factor, but um, it became a, in order to prepare for the grants, this is what I tell my students, I told my students, in order to prepare for the grants, I did a lot of research or sufficient research, let's say. This is made by Victor Justo. He's the one who made the young man who made the mask in the catalog. And this one might look familiar. This was the proposal for the Tinker Foundation grant application. I kind of, I spoke with so many faculty at, East, at OSU, so many. Um, it was my pastime for a whole semester. Um, apart from making ceramics and, and doing the sculpture thing I needed to do, I developed this proposal and showed it to everybody um, and changed it each time I showed it. 
So tradition and the transformation of styles, a documentation and analysis of the horned carnival masks of the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Puerto Rico, an artist's response. Now, two things there. When I say carnival masks, I should have put festival masks. As I got into it, I realized that other festivals were a starting point for mask celebration. And an artist's response, um, truthfully, that was to make clear that I was not doing a formal study. Um, I was doing a study as an artist, and it, it certainly has uh, enriched my artwork indirectly. So there it is. This um, paper, uh, I'll send it. Megan, I'll send the paper to you so you can have it somewhere on file. There were three documents, a bibliography, this one, and just a moment. I might have another one up ahead. This is the interesting part for me. Um, coming from a, a small college in Ohio and going to the biggest college in Ohio 12 years later after becoming a potter, I really made use of all the resources at OSU. And you can see some of the names. If you've been there a while, you might remember some of them. Douglas Graham was the uh, coordinator for the Tinker Foundation. Stephen Summerhill was the dean, I believe, of something. Um, Mike Chipperfield was my advisor in ceramics. Charles Messi was dean of the uh, School of uh, Department of Art. Robert, Robert Arnold was dean of the School of the Arts. I, I don't remember everything, and um, there it is. But I spoke with each of these people. It was very um, strategic, and I had a chart, as you see. After, oops, after I got back the next year, I had the opportunity to set up the show, a show of the pieces, including um, photos that I'd taken in the lobby of the office at OSU Mansfield, the president's office there. Some of the study. This is Doña Iselsa. She was the aunt of a friend of mine, who was a friend of mine, who um, in Cabral, a small town in Dominican Republic in the Northwest, a very poor town with caliche uh, as the main soil ingredient, um, calcium, decomposed calcium stone. She dug her clay. There's the mask that you folks have somewhere, and I hope it's somewhere in storage at least, paper mask using wheat paste for um, for glue. And that's unfinished. I tried to collect unfinished masks as well as finished ones. There it is. Temistocles from Cabral. He was a doctor, a student of medicine. Uh, he was gonna be a doctor of medicine, which he is. Um, and he learned to make masks from his aunt. I have that mask here, which I'll show you at the end of the slideshow. It's made with crepe paper and it's held up for 34 years, 33 years, uh, more or less. I do appreciate the restoration work done at OSU by Leonardo and, and or whatever crew it was, students and faculty both. It's amazing to me. That's when it was seeing better days. It's a rhinoceros, uh, more or less used in Day of Independence. And this is the most famous mask maker in Dominican Republic, Felipe Abreu, in La Vega, near Santiago. And you can see this you know, typical, stereotypical, maybe devil face mask in red, horn mask, with cow's teeth. Now, Felipe starts with a clay mold, puts on heavy uh, sugar sack or cement sack paper, whatever he can get that he soaks in water. Um, I have videos of him talking and I interviewed him. And he said, I get my ideas. I look up in the sky and see the clouds passing. And it gives me ideas for shapes. He's a true artist. These are also from La Vega from a younger um, craftsman. I'm not sure of his name, so I didn't put it in. Um, these are all from 1987. 
And this is made by Victor Justo, the one who made the young man who made the original mask I saw. And this is the start of a phoenix head mask, a griffin, phoenix or griffin. It's amazing. I think this woman's first name is Maria. Her husband's name Jose. Uh, but since I'm featuring her, I put their last name only. Uh, Señora Dominguez de la Cruz, Dominguez de la Cruz. Monte Cristi is also near the Haitian border. And this piece uses real cow's horns. And there it is. Pedro Diaz Jimenez was in the capital, Santo Domingo, and ran, or yeah, I would say ran, it's 30 plus years ago, uh, a candy shop. But in his plenty of spare time, he made masks that move. And as you know, the, the mouth on this one opens and closes. I think I have his name in a future slide. Um, and I also have one of the masks that he made in Santiago. On the right is a mask that was, on my right, is a mask that was too large to bring back. I bought it, actually I commissioned it, and then when it came time to take the flight home, um, there was no way to ship it or take it. So it is now in the collection of my ceramic assistant from 1981. And it's one of their family's prized possessions. It's made for decoration more than anything. If it's ever worn, it, it would fall apart. Uh, I had more names in these, a few more. In Ponce. And you see the video camera I bought with, brought with all the way around the Caribbean. Ah, Leonardo Pagan. He made the largest mask I have, um, which is here in Wilson. Another Puerto Rican mask maker. The materials varied. Some use heavy sacks, some just use newspaper. His were very fragile, so I didn't dare to try to send it to OSU. Colorful. Ah, Felix Vasquez, a pescador. And this mask, I hope, uh, made it safely, and uh, it's one of my favorites. It weathered a little damage. Uh, I used to do art in the schools programs in California, then Iowa, and Ohio too, and I in North Carolina, and I'd bring the masks with me and show the students. So they've traveled quite a bit. Luisa Aldea has its own celebration and its own style of mask using coconut husk. A tiburon mask, a hammerhead shark mask from Naiguata in northern Venezuela. Oh, here's a part of the list of the festivals I got to see in three months. This will be on file, so I'm going to just click through. The main exciting part was to video the celebration of the Diablos Danzantes of Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi is um, in June, and Venezuela is my first country. This town is famous for huge anthropomorphic masks. And one of the hugest ones came, it was sent in a crate that was three and a half by three and a half feet. I still have the crate, it goes with me to Spain. The mask is at OSU. And this there are videos of the celebration. I didn't I don't have a converter to to get the, the recorded the 30 hours of recorded tape in any format digitally. It's a super eight, I believe. And uh, I still have them. I sent most of them to OSU, in fact. So um, that's a resource someone might get to someday. Um, Anyway, the celebration of Corpus Christi is a um, little hard to explain. It involves three days of dancing around town, a 
lot of drinking and it's blessed by the priest at the church. So it's kind of get thee gone, O devil celebration. And this is the mask at OSU. Um, I believe I sent photos of these being, uh, my sebachromes of these being made. Most of the images are in, in that. And there they are, it's a big project. These are the molds from which the pieces are made. There's cement in this case. And there's the mask. Padding, because they're so big. Juan Morgado, I think we have a photo of him. Nope, that was. That's my last slide from the travels. Um, this mask is also at OSU. I think it went to Dr. Summerhill's office as part of my coming back and donating something. So good luck finding it if you want. Um, the one that I have sent this year is uh, a little more expressive and a little larger. In my teaching, I always have given as a sculpture project um, individual masks. And these are just three, two here and one more of what the students took and ran with. That's at Barton and then some years ago at East Carolina University. And that is my slideshow. And I'm back live. Are there any questions? Uh, some of the some of the masks that we received. Um, thank you so much for that donation, Mark. Um, but there's so much more shiny, you know, in the in the original pictures that you have. That's the most striking thing for me. That that some of that shine has um, gone out of it. And um, I think part of our work, well, we just sort of cleaned them, you know. Um, that that was the extent of what we did for now. Um, but I think that we will be working with the, the restor restoration and formatting division of the library to, to just see, or maybe you have ideas about how to restore the shine without doing anything uh, that would compromise the mask or that would be inappropriate from a curatorial standpoint uh, from your perspective. Very simple. Uh, yes, we're all losing our shine over the years. I, I feel that. Um, one thing I would do, uh, I'd recommend with no problem, is to um, use a matte, a very light coat at first, of matte gloss spray. Not fixative, but a matte gloss polyurethane. Um, that shouldn't hurt them. They're just paper, and they, they absorb a little bit, but they've all been, they've all had oil paint on them. So, why would it I be something like this? Way. This is this is a gloss yes, one. It would be that as long as that is clear. No, I wouldn't put gloss at first. So matte, okay. I would start with matte, but then, then maybe gloss at the. You know, if the matte doesn't do enough, then I'd put gloss on. Okay. But the gloss does have a, yeah. yeah, it has a slight chance of uh, uh, altering it by making it too shiny in the wrong places. Okay. He's going to get some. Oh, look. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Look how old and faded it is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And one more. Wow. So did you get a chance to talk to people about 
Um, why the horns? I mean, there's so many different types of horns that, that we see in the masks, um, but what, what are the general impressions or interpretations of, of the horns? When I went in, I had a, a big load of theory, or a load of theory to get the grant and all, and to think it through. Most of the mask makers gave me a very quick answer. And it wasn't the same for each person. I don't, I can go back in my notes and look a little more, but it was mainly a pretty facile answer. Not that, um, um, well, not, that's not true. In Monte Cristi, um, with, with the real horns, I think someone in the family, maybe, maybe the mask maker or her husband, <coughs> said um, there were cows in Africa. You know, I'm not sure. That might be a construct I put on it. In some of the presentations I have, a very similar mask from West Africa juxtaposed with the mask from Monte Cristi. So that's one that I'm not sure about. Um, the tiny mm -hmm. horn, they're to, uh, para ser lo más vistoso to make it more interesting visually is what I was told by the fellow who made it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not much of an answer there. Um, I still have all my, my uh, preconceived theories and I can apply them, but the makers don't have, to me, didn't have much um, to say about where it came from. And it might have been I didn't go deep enough. Did they? Did they? I was only there a hundred days. Yeah. Did they call them cuernos or what was the word that they used? Cuernos or cachos. 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 Okay. Yeah, cuernos. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, alongside your masks, we're we're also exhibiting some Andean uh, masks that are uh, known as like they they belong to the character Ayauma, and. Um, I think that there was a misinterpretation where it has some things on its head and the Europeans immediately thought that they were horns, cachos or cuernos, right? And that this, and they, they misnamed the character Diablo Uma, but the, uh -huh. but the interpretation of the, of the character is not a Diablo, it's a, it's a spirit head, but not a Diablo, right? So just kind of interesting to see different people's perspectives on what the horns potentially mean, so yeah. Well. The mo now that you got me thinking more deeply about it, the most common was the devil horns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As the most, or to scare the children. Okay. And I like the, the, this didn't have horns, but the shark mask, the hammerhead shark mask from Venezuela, from the coast, the fellow who made it said, this is to scare the kids. And he went around and scared his little nephew, um, <laughs> and laughing, and, and he performed for me in a way. Uh, saying that this is the, the biggest animal around, the most scary animal. It's to, to kind of get everybody excited about the fear, the little free song of fear during the dance. Thank you. So these are called caretas o cachua. Um, mascarilla, no. Mascaras. Careta is the most um, common name I heard throughout the Caribbean for you so in, in addition to to the mask and the devil mask when you actually saw the performance and and the dance during the festival the the people carry anything else in addition to the mask to scare people yes what were like some of the 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 artifacts or things that they use because i'm trying to see like maybe the connection the work that i have done in ecuador not only they have a mask for the devils, but they carry all kinds of other things. And a long time ago, they actually had like live snakes and, and anything that would scare wow. people uh, or tarantulas. But, you know, they could be anything else, like you said, to, to scare the kids. So not only you had the mask and, you know, everything that it takes to make the mask, but in addition to that, they were carrying some other things, like even chili peppers to make people fight on them and, and all kinds of things like that. So I was wondering if, if you witnessed anything like that or, or not at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. 
in the um, Dominican Republic, in Cabral, uh, they carried a whip. And I sent one of the whips with the box. You have a whip. Uh, as if it were herding uh, cattle. And they chase each other with the whips. In um, Yare, in, in Venezuela, they had a rattle with little horns on it. Um, I'm not sure if I sent one. Um, I could send it if if uh, if I find another one. Um, but it's a rattle, and they use that to uh, add energy. Also, most of the costumers had a complete costume, especially in Dominican Republic, where building the costume would take about a month's worth of time and about a month's worth, worth of income in some cases. So it was a complete costume to, it, including and especially with gloves, to hide the hands because with hands being visible, people could tell who it was. And so um, that's a partial answer. I didn't see anything like chili peppers or tarantulas, um, but it's a great idea. <laughs> No, in the Dominican Republic, when you get hit with one of those, it's supposed to bring you good luck for the rest of the year. Yes. That's what the, the person who's hitting says. Yes. When I was little, I was told those were made from cow guts, the whips. It is extremely one, painful. Ah. And, and now in Santo Domingo, I went back uh, three years ago on the Malecon in the capital there was a, a festival, I think it was Independence Day. Yes, Febrero, 27 de Febrero. And there were people in carnival garb, complete, the whole malecón was, estaba lleno. And it, it, it went further afield than, than when I went in 87. Yeah. Well, the, the, um whips that Leonardo is mentioning, the Asial, in the festivals that I uh, study, they take on another meaning, which is that the overseers used to use Asiales uh, to um, kind of control indigenous workers. And actually, there's a, there are two Asiales that, that, that I, ha I have one, and then one is with OSU that has like a head, and it's been worn down so much in brass that I always thought it was a snake, right? But um, the person selling it to me, who was very old and had actually, you know, um, been alive during the time of the of haciendas, he said, "No, it's a dog," and uh, uh, the dogs had a particular significance, just in terms of being used by the haciendados to sick on people, right? So that carries a whole other interpretation in the in the festivals that I do. But the ayauma you know, this horn um, or, or, you know, the one with the prongs on the head um, also carries the asial also to scare people and kind of transgress the festival space. Other characters kind of stay in the festival space, but the ayauma in particular is, is like this very ambiguous, like sometimes he imposes control, sometimes chaos. And uh, when he transgresses the festival space, all the kids run, everybody runs. The other thing that they carry often is, um, the what do you call it like stinging nettle yeah um and they they threaten to to brush people with the with the stinging nettle also mm -hmm. i had a question about uh whether there are traditions of displaying the masks beyond festival contexts in the dominican republic there were no traditions of that, but there was a museum there was in a museum. Santiago. Mm -hmm. There was. Oh, okay. Um, and I have the, the name of the owner of the museum because it was private, and he's written about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Fradique Lizardo. And by the way, if anyone wants to follow up, I'm here for another couple months. I'll. I'll I'll dig through some of my notes as needed, but OSU has all the papers, so um, we're covered if you really want to know who. Fradique Lizardo did a video on the masks, and uh, he had the museum, a private museum, and he wrote a, a small booklet as well, which I think I sent to OSU. And are there any uh, 
I don't know, kind of uh, methods or, or ways to present the masks, which are, would be kind of um, respectful for the, the nature of the, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, given that their indigenous context, you know, are there ways in which OSU can kind of um, acknowledge that in, in, in the way that they're displayed? Uh, by well, um, in the Museo del Hombre in Santo Domingo, mm -hmm. the Anthropological Museum, there is a large room with dedicated to masks. First, there's a wall of masks from each region, and then there's a vitrine, a very large one, with full, some full-scale full figures with masks and costumes. Mm -hmm. When I went three years ago, or four years ago, it was very, very neglected, but originally it must have looked very vibrant and uh, mm -hmm. that that's a lot of work because not only do you need to get the mess, but the costumes. Mm -hmm. And I did not collect costumes. One other question was uh, your decision to to buy uh, unfinished masks. Was that yes. like, uh, were you thinking, were you interested in the process or are we, were there other reasons oh, yeah. for, okay. No, I'm, I'm a craftsman, so the mm -hmm. process is very important. And that was something that no one would think to buy or to yeah. sell to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd pay ten dollars each for most of the, for each of those. Mm -hmm. You don't want that; it's not finished. Well, that's precisely. I want to see <laughs> the different technique. Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, in in our um, Andean and Amazonian indigenous art and cultural artifact collection, we also have unfinished um, different things, tapestries, things like that. Exactly for that reason, for the process. And um, uh, one of the members who is not here of our, of our uh, working group, of the Katawi Daikuna working group, um, Eric Johnson, had um, been very insistent about like, recognizing the producers of raw materials as artists also, uh, as opposed to just the artists that do the finished product. So I love you know, like the, the images that you show of people like working the clay, like stepping on the clay, um, you know, producing the paper, whatever, uh, that's one of our emphases also is to just sort of recognize the process as part of that artisanal process, you know. Good. It, it's also useful when I gave the project to my undergraduates here in North Carolina, I would show them all those slides and talk about the materials and the methods they could use. So it, it led to a lot more variation and better construction probably. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question following up on Richard's uh, question about presentation with respect. Uh, are there are there any rituals surrounding the masks um, before people wear them? And then the other question is whether people wear the same mask two years in a row or whether each year they retire those masks and have to make new ones. Wow. I I wish I knew the answers, but I have a, a shot. Um, there's no ceremony that I saw or ritual of, of, of dousing it with rum or anything like that. Um, the place I would look more carefully would be in, be in uh, Venezuela and Yadi. Um, that was, those were uh, blessed, the dancers at the beginning of the festival were blessed by the priest using um, holy, holy water. So in a way, that's that's the only answer I have to that. The other masks, no. And I believe they, that in mainly in Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, people use the same mask more than once. Now, another thing that brings me to is that the masks have become a lot more complex over the years, a lot more uh, heavily decorated, and new elements are included. Um, plastic toys, mirrors. Um, I have more slides of that stuff too, but I want to keep it manageable today. Um, but um, this is 1987. In 1970, this would just be smooth. I'm, I'm pretty sure. And so they added more complexity as it became a, a tourist commodity at times. And also to compete over the years, things became more complex.
Can you talk more about the competition aspect of it? Well, a little bit more. In Ponce, there are two styles, uh, Ponce proper and Playa de Ponce. And you can tell the masks, uh, I forget which is which now, but this is one style and the other is with larger horns and fewer of them. Um, let me see what else. Well, Juan, you could talk about the Dominican Republic too. Uh, if you've been back recently, the masks are getting bigger and fancier everywhere there because they're, they're a pre, number one, they're appreciated as a cultural resource, but more, <laughs> more to the point also, I believe is uh, they're sold to tourists, but they're also um, a friendly kind of aesthetic competition to show off dedication to the, the craft or a form of bling that's, that's very visible. That's a whole paper. And you, and you use the appropriate word there, it, bling. Yep. I know, especially in La Vega, and, and they, they take those Diablo Cojuelo masks very seriously there. I, I was amazed the last time I, I was there for February. It's the, 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 the from the, from their head to their toes, these, these outfits are just incredible. It's, I, it, it's amazing that people make them by hand. Thank you, yeah. Hello, I have, uh, hey. I have well, a question. Well. Um, sure. It's very interesting to see all these masks. Uh, I come from Bolivia and we also have a very important tradition of masks in the folklore, in the folklore. But something I learned, which I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure about the evolution of the masks in Bolivia, but I'm, I've heard that uh, there was a moment in the 60s and 70s where they evolved into the current shapes and forms because they were influenced by the Chinese uh, style since the trading started with China. So we had like devil's masks, but after that encounter with Chinese culture, it became more dragon-like. I don't know if you had something like that also in the evolution of the masks that you have worked with. I'm not aware of that, but again, this was 30 plus years ago. I'm sure by now that's a big factor. And that's the disadvantage of being an artist view. I'm not an anthropologist and I didn't dedicate enough time to really have good conclusions or follow that train of thought, which would be fascinating. Thank you. So um, I wonder, Richard, if I can invite you um, to maybe talk a little bit about how this donation inspired the class that you taught this semester, d delving into a more theoretical, more global sort of approach to masks. Um, I just found that fascinating uh, and I hadn't heard much about how your class turned out. So can you share that with us? Sure. So I was teaching two classes last semester on one on writing art criticism and another on uh, philosophical problems in the arts. And uh, as part of some research that I've been doing uh, about uh, this, the legacies of this exhibition that I'm um, kind of unlearning from uh, Documenta 14, which includes a lot of indigenous practices uh, um, and indigenous artists from around the world, a kind of global indigenous network of artists. Uh, one of the big questions that was kind of um, coming to the fore was this question of kind of mediation um, and especially the question of kind of white settler mediation um, and especially uh, questions of um, 
what is uh, in the philosophy of our class kind of what is art like how do we define it and uh, kind of beyond the fine art so i i chose the form of the mask as a kind of uh uh a a form that would um go through both classes and both classes had uh, to make a mask at the end of the semester as part of their investigations, either into writing, so questions of um, writing as pseudonyms or what kind of mask is we, we, we take, how to like um, think about writing as yourself or in a persona and these kinds of questions, so kind of symbolic conceptual masking. Um, and then in the philosophy of art, thinking through different media, like how to make a mask out of photography, how to make a mask out of words, how to make a mask um, uh, as a sculptural object, these kinds of questions. Um, and throughout both classes, I'd have these sections of reflection um, that were um, uh, weeks um, uh, uh, focused on different elements of the mask. And uh, so the first section was about colonial collections of masks and the question of the role of the mask in museums uh, and uh, questions also of how um, issues of primitivism in, in modernist conceptions of art making. Uh, so the mask is, you know, a specifically contested uh, site for discussions of colonial uh, violence and appropriation. Uh, the second um, session uh, was about uh, performance and masks and, and, and masks and theatre uh, that went back to some of my own training in ancient Greece. Uh, and questions of mask, but also looked at kind of no theatre in Japan as well. Uh, the third section was uh, um, uh, about uh, this particular question of mediation uh, and uh, how masks can take on digital forms as well. Uh, and then the fourth section was really about embodiment and, and questions of uh, masks in, in performance, masks in ritual and these kinds of issues. So. I and then, of course, by the time I taught the fourth section, the COVID crisis had happened and the mask had become a whole, had a whole other cultural formation um, because, of, because of that crisis. So, and I think that that really impacted the students in the, the masks they ended up making. Um, I wanted them to come to class wearing their masks as part of uh, a final project, but they couldn't do that because we were remote by that point. Um, so I would get their... Uh, and so many of the masks were kind of more COVID inspired than through some of the traditions that we've been looking at throughout the semester. Um, and uh, the other thing is I've been using this book, so I'm just reaching across to it, uh, that was, it's a really kind of traditional um, art historical account of the mask, um, which is Hans Belting, uh, Face and Mask, A Double History. Uh, and I, I use this as a kind of foil for a lot of the class because um, uh, it goes through certain topics of, of, of masks and kind of cultural formation. And actually, his main argument is about death and the mask um, and how the mask is just in all its forms, whether it's in photographs of masks, films of masks, performance and ritual, uh, the primitive, primitivist appropriation of masks, so much of it is to do with a, a human dialogue with, de with death. Um, so that's one of Belting's arguments. And again, that really came to the fore with the COVID um, crisis too, because the mask as kind of barrier or protection um, took on a whole other valence. So uh, a lot of this was, you know, I didn't, you know, I, 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 and I put all this on my blog, my Minus Plato blog, so you can find the different sections and the readings that we did for each section of, of the, these topics. So it was very kind of conceptual, but the main impetus was what is an art form that um, breaks through traditional fine arts associations with painting, drawing, photography, video, these kinds of things. And what, what, what is the mask? Um, and what does it mean to wait, make a mask? What does it mean to wear a mask? So very basic questions um, that, that were there. But, you know, Mark, if you were, if we had a conversation with my students, I think it would have been uh, really incredible for them not only to see your archival images of you there and the, the, the makers there, uh, but also um, 
I, I think that I think I'd made this whole discussion a little too theoretical. And so I think they kind of hungered for a hands-on how to make. So I bet they would have had questions about, well, how do you do that? Or like, how does that work? Is that just paper, you know, actually wanting to go into the making process uh, a lot more. So I do regret that we didn't have Sorry, that I missed it. Yeah, I'm sorry too. Um, but yeah, sorry I took a bit of time to explain it. It's a long uh, project, but I, I, as I said, the strange thing was this feeling of culturally the the figure of the mask transitioned at that at the moment within the course and and I mean it's almost like the students had this kind of sense that I was doing this on purpose. But how could I have known that the the the, the whole the whole cultural conversation around masks and mask making and what it means to wear a mask would change. So, you know, I don't know what their, I mean, I have some feedback from the students about that, that particular valence, but it was, it was, it was, we really struggled through that, you know, that, that issue. Um, well, well, thank you very much, Mark. I know that you've got to get going. I want to be cognizant of your time. I know we told you that we'd have you out of here by 2.25. Um, I just sent everybody my excuse. I have a dentist's excuse. <laughs> I'll be wearing a mask. <laughs> um, thank you. It's been lovely. I'll see you next week, maybe. Is there one more? Yes, we're going to keep doing these. Yes, next week's um, coffee okay. hour, we're going to do a taste of Latin America. So we have um, Linda Blanchard, um, who has gone on some of our outreach educator programs. Uh, she'll be demonstrating how to make different types of um, salsas. Uh, and we are always looking for new topics for our coffee hours. We hope that these will continue throughout the summertime. Um, and I know Mark, you'll be living in Spain, but hopefully when we all get back to campus, um, we will be able to continue with some of our plans working with Michelle and Richard uh, and Leonardo and uh, our colleagues from the libraries to do the mask exhibit and really uh, showcase those masks finally to students and to do some programming around them. Um, we were so Thank disappointed you. that was all canceled. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, and, uh, uh, maybe uh, un compromiso for, for, for the future is um, we also have, oh, there he goes. I'll tell him later. Oh, no, there you are. Um, we also have a collection of uh, ceramic, uh, Amazonian ceramic. And so we're fascinated by your pottery work um, as well. And maybe at some point we can arrange to do that again. Um, I know that you have to go, but I wanted to see if other people can stay and just run something by Leonardo and see if he has that video for us as well. Bye, Mark. So, Leonardo, I had a question for you, which uh, unfortunately Mark has, has um, had to go, but um, I was looking at another piece by uh, John Nunley. He works at, in St. Louis and uh, did a whole catalog on masks also. But the framework that they use is more about transformation, right? And um, what we see is that the behavior of the wearer of the mask changes in performance. And I, I think that you probably observed that um, in Ecuador, uh, for sure, during, during the Diablada Festival. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about like how, how people behave as they're wearing this mask. What are they doing? What is the, how do they embody basically the character that they're wearing? Yeah, so there's, they're characters, right? So there's different characters. Um, and each character has their own type of performance, right? So you have the, the line dancers, for example, um, they wear the mesh uh, mask and they look like Los Hacenderos, the ones that own the land and they have the, the blue eyes on the mask and the ruby uh, red lipstick, right? And they dance very formally um, down the streets through the procession, right? And that's their role. Their role is to be very formal, very uh, like synchronized dancing with their partners and so forth. Um, and then you have the devil, right? And then Los Diablos, um, they're free to do whatever they want. But one of the things that um, I, I hopefully will we'll get to do this when, when we connect again is um, to actually have one of the, the performers talk to us because the Diablos have multiple roles, not only to, to scare people, uh, but part of that scaring the people is to open up the street 
for the line dancers. So even though today, you know, we focus a lot on the Diablos because they have the more interesting mask and they do the more crazy things. Uh, at the same time, more traditionally, it was for them to open the crowd, right? Uh, so the line dancers can perform. Now, the Diablos, they have the horns, they have the chilies, they have the snakes. I mean, they were, you know, I got to interview a few people and I mean, it all depends on the era and what will affect people, what would affect society. Um, because they told me that even maybe 20 years ago, um, they would grab even like dirty magazines and they would, you know, walk around the streets with the dirty magazines and show them to old ladies, you know, just to scare them or to kids and things like that. Uh, and again, just playing with that, what is horror, you know, for, for society at this particular moment, right? Um, they will bring monkeys from the Amazon because in the Andes they didn't have them, right? So then you have a little bit of the trade and that also affects the performance um, as well, right? So then they would look for things that will uh, scare the, the, the people, right? The people within the community, at least in Piso. Uh, and then you have other characters as well. You have the bear and the hunter. So you always are going to have a character of the hunter and, and the bear. Um, and you have the somebody who uh, sweeps the streets, right? And a lot of it, uh, and I don't know, no me acuerdo, I don't remember the name now. Uh, la, la Guaricha, La Guaricha, which is a female character that traditionally was only performed by men. So the men will get into the, um, the female costume, right? Um, and it wasn't until lately that it kind of like opened up, but traditionally women were not. Uh, part of the procession, right? Part of the performance, not even in the line dancers. So the first role that the woman kind of like took into the performance was the line dancers, right? Because they was a female. And then they go into the wadicha. Uh, and now you have women which are devils as well. Uh, and there are a few other characters as well. Um, but it's, everybody has a role to play. And the other important role, at least, at least for Pichado, and in Ecuador, I think it's, it's very common, uh, are la, la Banda de Pueblo, like the band that goes with each group um, is extremely important uh, for the people. And for me, visually, I see a lot of musicians, but I have all the other characters, I have all the other customs. Um, so visually, I will focus on them. But from their perspective, what's very important that keeps everything together and everything moving forward is La Banda. Right, because they keep the rhythm, they keep the songs, right? So then the line dancers have to follow that rhythm, they have to follow that beat. And they if the band is doing well, the dancers are going are doing well. If the dancers are doing well, then all the other performers, right, can can participate uh, the best possible way. And from my perspective as an outsider and as a visual person, the band was behind, right? And the band just like, okay, some whole bunch of guys with musical instruments. I see that every day. Um, but it has a much bigger role as well into the performance of everybody else in the group. So, um, yeah, so that, that's, but now it opens up so much. And I think, uh, Richard, you were mentioning something, and I think uh, Mark as well, in terms of, and actually Juan, uh, you, you mentioned this as, as, as well, in terms of like the new type of mask and how, you know, international trade might, might actually affect as well. Um, you see that a lot in terms of the creation of the masks. The masks are not only just the traditional mask, but now the, the artisans are creating all kinds of masks. I mean, you're gonna have, what is it? The, the sponge, that funny cartoon about a square sponge, something like that. So you have that, you have dragons, um, you have a mixture of traditional mask and new characters. You have superheroes. Uh, and, and now it blends so much and there's so much tourism for it, right? So now there's competition and who's the best artist and then who's the best performer. Um, another thing about the performers as well that has to do with the devils is that friends will, um, will change the outfits. Um, so they, they don't wear the same devil mask every day because they want to confuse people. Right? They might know their friends and they want to confuse their friends and they want to confuse everybody. So they might switch costumes, the clothes, the whips that they have, they'll, they'll change the mask. Um, they want to keep people guessing because the worst thing that can happen to at least to one of the devils or to any of the performers 
is to lose that, that hidden identity. Um, it's extremely important for them to keep that because they're going to be performance and doing very crazy things to a lot of people, even policemen. They're going to mess with the old people. They're going to mess with the old ladies. Um, El Latigo takes a very phallic um, performance as well. And so it, it gets, it gets well, you know, very interesting. So sometimes to protect themselves as well, they want to keep that, uh, their identity secret. Um, so then there's a lot, you know, how do you do that, right? What do you have to do to be able to keep yourself hidden? And you can change costumes and do different things. Leonardo, can I just follow up on, on that? The uh, modern updating, I have this example of this here. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a really interesting story. This is actually an artwork by uh, a photographer called uh, Will Wilson. And what he does is he takes photographs of indigenous artists wearing or engaging with the work that they already do. And so this, um, the, the use of the stormtrooper with um, um, patterns from the Pacific Northwest, um, from the Haida and from the um, uh, Kwakwakwetil uh, cultures, uh, comes from an artist called Andy Everson. And he, so it's, it's the artist Andy Everson wearing it. And he has, I don't know if you can see, kind of, yeah, uh, um, yeah. uh, the the rattle there and and then the uh, this kind of thing so he's wearing this in relation to the uh, to the patterning that he's done so it's a very complex um, engagement between the photographer and the artist uh, at the same time but yeah the the, the stormtrooper um, yeah that's pretty awesome. my, my son likes it uh, that's why I brought it back from a, an exhibition I stole one of the uh, cardboard cutouts of it, so. Yeah. Um, thinking about uh, presentation, um, Leonardo, the idea of bringing in a performer via Zoom or something like that um, as part of the discussion and uh, event, it sounds amazing. And also, now that you mentioned, I mean, this is um, kind of a um, repeating mistake that we make, right? Like where uh, we focus on the visual and the the oral is like sort of lost. So thinking about playing banda music, you know, to create like more of a of an environment for the masks uh, sounds also pretty amazing. You know, I love I love those uh, components just to have a more holistic thing. You know, uh, recognizing that we are the the performance is so key that we're kind of disembodying these masks mm -hmm. from their dynamic, right? Um, yeah, it, it's it's a lot more than just the visual. It's the behavior or the artifacts, uh, the clothes, el atuendo, um, mm -hmm. the, the music, right, the taste, uh, and then everything else that you add to it in, in modern times as well that makes it more complex. But it also makes it very interesting to kind of like understand and go in a little bit deeper to notice those changes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very fascinating um, mm -hmm. because it's going very fast, it's happening very fast. Mm -hmm. I also love how multi-layered, you know, these uh, uh, festival performances are. So there's not one interpretation of what it means, but it could be multiple things like the layering of the traditional with the new, you know, the layering of the colonial, you know, with uh, resistance, um, ideas of both like, uh, uh, owning a, a new a different identity you know and also protecting that identity keeping it hidden keeping it explicit you know like different things like that and i love mark's comment about the importance of the gloves and how people can be recognized by their hands you know so that's another sort of cultural uh, insight as well so so i don't have the, the video with me so megan i don't know if you found it I did. Um, let me see. I can. <laughs> can everyone see? Mm -hmm. The music doesn't match. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, that's a, that one doesn't have all the results, but that's a shorter one, actually. Uh, there was another one that actually show you um, the different actual shots of the mask with the contrast. Um, I, I can show you, I can send it. You guys. Um, I love, I love, you know, Mark's emphasis on the process and then the process after, you know, like, so the curatorial process and the photography process uh, combined with that. Um, so maybe we can actually bring in some of those slides from his original work where the masks were all shiny, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. uh, the before and after, but in any case, that's amazing. What an amazing yeah. video. Yeah, These actually, I, 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 I wanted to ask, and Mark, but he, but he was, he had to leave. It's like this, this videos that, that he has and how many hours, I mean, if the school has them, it wouldn't be so much to actually be able to convert them digitally. And I don't know if he actually made a video, you know, if he, if he edited it into anything or if he just had all the raw footage. Um, but that's something that personally, I would love to just watch and, and, and see what's there uh, because I'm sure that, that that not only can be digitalized, but also just to have it is, is, is a way to, to present something, a couple of clips from that, from the festivals, from the uh, people making them. Um, I think that would be also helpful. And so it's easier to access, right? Because I think most, most people are not going to use, you know, a super eight, right? Where are you going to have a super eight recorder now? But having them digital would be a, a good way for students to, to access them. And if you do like a, a two minute, less than five minute clip edit of highlights and things like that, at least it gets people uh, involve or an easier way for people just to access it. Like, okay, I want to see what else is there. Um, what else is in the videos, right? And they could do something else as well uh, mm -hmm. to add to their research. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, so I think we have those. Uh, Megan, are they still stored at the Mershon Center? Is that where they are? Yeah, so we have them. And um, yeah, absolutely. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah, we'll figure out how to get them to you, Donado, because if you're interested in, in doing that, that's something that would really be beneficial and that I personally don't have the ability to do. So that would be incredible. Yeah, I, I think that there's, there's people that I know that, that could do first, just like the, the crossover. Um, but I think, yeah, if there's not like a final project that he presented, um, then going through them and just kind of like have some highlights or, or just some a little bit of background information on them yeah. could really help um, let people know what's there. Be amazing um, as, a, as a resource. Yeah. So this gets us really thinking about like the event. Uh, we don't know when that will be. Um, it's been postponed. Um, but eventually like the, the exhibit at the Thompson Library combined with a panel discussion with both um, experts on Europe, uh, the Americas, different time periods, you know, just to sort of Think about masks more generally, um, and as as we as we think through all the resources that we have and how rich the material is that Mark uh, donated, not just the masks, but all the accompanying notes and videos.